Good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm Sergeant Trinidad. Uh, I'm a forward police officer. I've been with the police department for 31 years. Okay. Uh, I'll be retiring in four years. Uh, and I love my job. This is a great profession. Uh, we have a great police department. We have great citizens. Public support is an amazing place to work. Uh, you're here at the Bob Boland Public Safety Complex. Uh, this is our brand new Police and Fire Academy. And I'm telling you, it's, thank you for your tax dollars. It's well spent, okay? This is an amazing facility we have. I'm part of the training staff at the academy right now. And it's just amazing. I, I teach the young officers that are coming through. I teach the older officers that have been out there for a while. Uh, teach them tactics, teach them what to do, how to make decisions, split second, life and death decisions. It's just a, it's a great uh, position I'm in. I'm in heaven right now, I'm in heaven. So we're coming full circle. Not only do I teach the police officers, but I'm also teaching the public. Unfortunately, we're at a point in this world where we have to teach you how to stay safe how to survive an active shooter event if you ever find yourself in something like that, okay? So what's important to understand is that you can survive an active shooter event, all right? The way you are right now, physically, tall, short, little overweight, whatever physical condition you find yourself in, you can defend yourself right now in an active shooter event. There are things you can do that are simple so that you increase your chances of surviving an active shooter event, okay? You don't have to be a boxing expert. You don't have to know mixed martial arts. You don't have to be a karate black belt. You don't have to be tall and muscular like me, okay? <laughs> that wasn't a joke, okay? <laughs> you are what you think you are, right? Yeah. Okay, so it, a lot of what I'm gonna uh, cover has to do with your mental outlook. So, uh, if you find yourself in an active shooter event or a deadly encounter, uh, you're going to be scared. But take that fear and turn it around and fight. If your only option is to fight, fight. And again, you don't have to be a black belt. You don't have to be a mixed martial arts expert to defend yourself, okay? So let's get started. So let me give you a little, a little history why we're here. So. Uh, back in 1966, we had a, 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 a suspect kill his mother, kill his wife, and then he worked his way to the Texas Tower at UT Austin, and from there had rifles and, and all kinds of weapons and started sniping at students that were around the campus. So officers respond, patrol officers respond. This was before we had SWAT teams. Patrol officers respond their guns can't reach that high. Their shotguns can't reach that high. Officers had to run home, get their hunting rifles, and try to, to stop the threat. They didn't have any specialized weapons at that time. So what happened? Patrol officers make their way to the top of the tower, and they stop the killing, okay, patrol officers. After that incident, uh, police departments throughout the country realized, hey, they need something special, something to address a situation like this if it ever happened again. So LA is, LAPD is credited with creating the first SWAT team, okay? They had rifles, special training, special tactics, and uh, other departments create their own SWAT teams. And officers were instructed, hey, if you encounter something like this again, just uh, set a perimeter and call for SWAT and SWAT will take care of the rest, okay? So fast forward to Columbine. Columbine 1999, uh, two kids go in, decide they're going to kill people. Okay? Uh, officers respond and do what they were trained. Uh, they set up a perimeter, call for SWAT, SWAT gets here after a while, and we know what happens. Uh, a dozen kids were killed, plus a teacher, and the police officers received a lot of criticism. Uh, why? Because the public thought we didn't do enough. Uh, but the officers did what they were trained to do, unfortunately. Since Columbine, we learned that we're dealing with a different type of killer. 
uh, and, the ter and the term active shooter was coined. Basically, an active shooter is somebody that's sole purpose, their mission is to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. So they're not looking for ransom. They're not looking to make a political statement necessarily. They're not looking to free a political prisoner or anything like that. Their sole goal at that moment is to kill as many people as possible. Okay, so there's no negotiating with this type of shooter. So after Columbine, uh, uh, San Marcos PD and Hayes County Sheriff's Department realized we have to change our tactics as to how we address this, how officers respond to what we call an active shooter. So they create this program, Alert, Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training, and they created uh, an active shooter response plan for officers. So now we train officers to respond, patrol officers to respond as a team and get in there as quickly as possible to stop the killing, okay? Uh, it, it's progressed from there that it, it's, it happens so quickly that we don't even have time to wait for an assist. The first officer gets in there, has to go in to stop the killing. And using the tactics that they teach and other agencies teach, we're better able to do that, okay? So coming full circle, we realize we have to teach the teachers and students what to do in the event of an active shooter. It's sad. You would think the kids would be safe at school, right? The teachers would be safe at school. That's not the case. So we have we're train we train the teachers and the students what to do if we have an active shooter, right? Well, it doesn't stop there. Now we're coming full circle and realize we have to train the public. Train you to know what to do in the event you're in an active shooter situation. And like I said, you don't need any special skills. You don't need to be tall and muscular like me. You, you just have to think, and I'm going to give you some tools to help you do that. So let's look at what happened in Columbine. So this is uh, the 911 call that was placed by the teacher, the librarian, when uh, she noticed the kids, uh, the suspects out there shooting. So this is the actual 911 tape. All right, I'm sorry. But basically what happened is the school uh, the librarian sees the two suspects, the two kids. They're in the, uh, a soccer field, and they're shooting, and they're throwing pipe bombs, okay? She thinks they're, they're doing some kind of film. They're filming something, okay? Because that, that just doesn't make any sense. She, she starts to move to the door to tell them to stop doing whatever they're doing, and then they start shooting at her, and she realizes this is not a, 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 a video. Uh, they're not filming anything. This is actually real. She runs back into the library and tells the students, get under the desk. She calls 911. She's frantic. She doesn't know what to do, so she's telling them to get under the desk, okay? It's scary, and they come in, and they're shooting, shooting more at, the, at her, at the students, okay? So it's a scary, tense situation. She doesn't know what to do. She's telling the students, get under the desk. Now, is that a, a tactic, a good tactic? But uh, let me explain something. So when we watch video in policing, we watch video of officers killing the line of duty, basically to see what they did. Can we learn anything from it, OK? Not to criticize the officer, but to learn from it. So just like in Columbine, she's faced with a situation that she shouldn't have to know. She shouldn't have to experience that, but it's happening. So we look at the video, we look at, listen to the tape, 
to see if we can learn from it, okay? So it's not criticizing her or the students or anything like that. It's to see what we can learn from it. So we now know high, when we're dealing with this type of shooter, active shooter, hiding under their desk is not a tactic. That doesn't save you, okay? Uh, there's more, more to it, okay? So let's look at another, let's look at this video. Now this is a, I wanted to explain, this is a reenactment. It's not the actual video. Uh, of how the students react. Yeah, excuse me. show you the whole thing but it's a reenactment okay so you see how chaotic it is the kids don't know where what to do where to go okay they're running this way they run that way they don't know what to do they go into the library they hide under the desk like they were told to do and the two shooters come in and start taunting the students okay and start shooting all right it's, it's scary it's scary but from this we can learn we learned and we teach students and teachers what to do in the event of a, an active shooter. You know, lock down, uh, barricade themselves in the classroom, uh, call 911, and so on. One of the things we need to understand about an active shooter is that they're looking for fame. A lot of them are looking, are motivated by fame. They want to be remembered. They want to be infamous, okay? Now, don't answer, but how many of you all know the names of serial killers? You can name off a dozen serial killers, all right? You, and, and, and I can also, but can we name their victims? We forget about the victims. We don't know the victims, but the serial killer is made infamous. They're on the front page of magazines, newspapers. Their movies are made about them, you know? Is that right? Does that make any sense that you're going to make this killer infamous. No, a lot of these uh, active shooters are motivated by, uh, they, they want to be famous. So what they do is study other active shooters and they know to be on the front page of Time magazines, they need to have a bigger body count, right? So they plan what they're gonna do and get that number and where do you see them? Front page of newspapers, Time magazine, uh, their name is mentioned throughout on the newscast. Uh, the Orlando shooter, did we see him on the front page of, of magazines, newspapers, and they mention, mention his name. So one of the things we, tr we try to tell people is, let's not mention their name. Don't mention their name. You know, If they're not publicized, they don't get that, uh, that att attention, then other copycat shooters are less likely probably to do that because they're not gonna get the attention that they seek, okay? So we don't wanna mention their name. We can, st the press can still tell the story, right? They can still tell what happened, what maybe the motivation, how it was done, but they don't have to mention the name to tell the story. Is that correct? You know, so let's not mention these people's names. So Amanda Ripley wrote a book, The Unthinkable, and here she, she studied how all, uh, people survive uh, disasters, okay? And she discovered that the people that survive a disaster uh, go through three stages of, of disaster response. We all do. We all, so there's three stages. There's denial. There's deliberation and this decisive movement. So the people that go through that process quickest are the ones most likely to survive because they prepared for 
that type of situation. So denial. What happens when we find ourselves in a, in a, in a dangerous situation? One, we don't believe it's happening, right? And that takes up time. That takes up time. We don't believe it's happening. So we try to process, we look at other people to, to see if we are reacting correctly. Hey, you're not moving, so maybe I'm not hearing or seeing the same thing you are, or maybe I'm overreacting. So we deny. When it finally, we finally realize it's happening, then we move to the deliberation phase. What are we going to do? And then after that, we take action. Or, or for some people, they take no action, okay? So she also interviewed a lot of people at the World Trade Center that survived the World Trade Center. And what they discovered was that the people that were in the tower when the planes hit, the people that were on the lower floor, when the plane hit, they hear an explosion, they feel the building shake, all right? People on the lower floor, it took them five minutes on average before they start moving out of the building, okay? So what are they doing during that five minutes? During that five minutes, they hear an explosion, they feel the building shake, they know that ain't right, but they look to each other to see, to validate their feelings. Are, are they overreacting? Well, Bob's not moving, uh, so I need to play it cool. I better, maybe I, I didn't hear what I heard, or maybe, you know, it was just a strong win. I don't know. But they're not moving. And then they start having a discussion with each other. Hey, what do you think that was? What should, what should we do? Whatever. Five minutes later, they start gathering their, their, their personal belongings. Some people are shutting down their computers. And then they start moving towards the exit, right? People on the higher floors that were closer to the explosion, it took them seven minutes before they started moving. Now, you would think where well, you're closer to the impact that you'd be the first ones down, right? It took them longer to realize what kind of situation they were in. It took them seven minutes. And again, they're gathering their personal belongings. They're looking to, uh, for validation from each other. Even though in their, gut, in their gut, they probably know, hey, I need to get out of here, but they don't want to overre overreact. They don't want to look foolish, so they look to each other for validation. Am I doing the right thing? Are you sensing the same thing? And then, again, they shut down their computers, gather their book, their purse, personal belongings, and then start moving now, okay? So here's a, a video about social, covering, basically covering that. Plays like this street in New York City, if you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander apathy, he's pretending uh, to be ill. Help, help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help. Help, please. Please help. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule we ought to help. And the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively, a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help. And it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Minute 
minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You all right? You all right? Yes, thank you. You sure? You look a bit flicky, you know what I mean? She suddenly you finds you herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, you want to shut up? Uh, you all right? Yeah. Sure. First I thought she was dead. Then I saw, check to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke that sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right. Six seconds. She name? even calls him sir, and suddenly no, everyone's fine. a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why, you're lying on the floor in the rain. Because he's part of the right group, everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in this position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that it was okay. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin his suit anyway. <laughs> okay. So, what's the moral of that story? Wear a suit, okay? You'll get immediate medical attention, okay? I got a little suit in my pocket, it stretches. Wear a suit. Ladies, wear a suit. All right, so let's break down that video of what happened. Uh, so the first person looks like a homeless person, right? Okay? Homeless people, uh, you don't know what mental state they're in, so you might be leery because it might be a dangerous situation. That's fine. But can you get on the phone and call the police or call for an ambulance? Right? Now, that's an old video, so I'm not sure how... Uh, 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 if cell phones were around uh, then, but surely there's phones where somebody could have made a phone call, right? But you saw when he's laying there, people are looking at him, and it, obviously he looks like he needs some kind of help, but they're, they're walking by because they're looking at each other also. Well, he's not doing anything. She's not doing anything. So maybe they know something I don't know. So they just walk on by. They, they, they look for, they don't want to stand out, right? So they look into other people to, to validate if, whether they're going to help or not. The second person, the female, uh, she's laying there, doesn't look like a homeless person, right? But again, there's a guy sitting there reading a paper and she looks like she's ill. So people coming by kind of looking, well, that guy's sitting there, so maybe he knows something I don't know. So I'm not going to get involved. I'm a look, instead of doing the right thing and just taking some kind of action, whether it's making a phone call or actually seeing if the lady needs help, people just don't take any action. Okay. The third guy is wearing a suit. Wear a suit. <laughs> okay. Six seconds, six seconds, because obviously uh, he doesn't look homeless. Uh, there's no question, hey, that's not normal, right? Should we have to be dressed like that in order to get help? No, we shouldn't have to be like that. If you, it, to maintain your safety, it's, it's very easy to just pick up the phone and call the police, let us figure out what's going on, while, and you still maintain your safety, okay? So one of the things we have to stop doing when we're, we find ourselves in a, uh, a deadly situation or active shooter type situation is stop looking to each other to validate whether we're taking the right action, right? Now, how many of you all have uh, go shooting? Or, okay, a few. Yeah, quite a bit. So for those, of, you know, so people, when you hear a gunshot, People uh, have stated a gunshot sounds like firecrackers or a car backfiring. Uh, so for those of you who have, uh, haven't gone shooting, I'm sh uh, this is a gunshot. 
That's a gunshot, okay? It's a loud bang. It's loud, okay? That's a gunshot. When you hear that, your body is going to tell you that's a gunshot. Your brain's going to say that sounded like a gunshot. So if your brain is telling you that sounded like a gunshot, it's a gunshot and take action, okay? Don't try to analyze it. Don't look to her. Don't look to him to see if they heard the same thing. They probably didn't hear it or they probably ignoring it or they're so focused on what their job that they tuned it out. But if you hear something that sounds like a gunshot, your brain tells you, that's a, well, that's a gunshot, then you need to take action. Get the H out of there, okay? And I forgot, uh, I apologize if I let out a curse word. Uh, I'll just say right now, I apologize. But don't look to each other to validate whether you're thinking the same thing, where you, uh, okay? We don't want to look foolish. That's one of the stumbling blocks for us. We don't want to look foolish, so we look for validation from other people. Hey, did they hear the same thing? Are they, are they running? Are they taking some action? No. If your brain says that's a gunshot, it's a gunshot. Get the out of there, okay? Right? So don't look to anybody for, for validation. So the first, first phase was denial. So once you get over the denial phase, okay, you, you hear that, what sounded like a gunshot, it is a gunshot, then what are you gonna do? Deliberation, you gotta decide what are you gonna do? So you hear a gunshot, you're at work, and you hear something. Should you be hearing a gunshot at work? All right? Should you be hearing firecrackers at work? All right? So if it's bang, bam, bam, Gunshot, take action, get out of there. You want to avoid. Where are the exits? So if you hear gunshot coming from this way and the exit, one of the exits is over there, are you going to go that way? No, you go out this way, right? Where are your exits? Do you know where your exits are, where you work? Uh, when you go to a restaurant, you know how you got in there. Now, what if you had to get out and the way you got in is blocked, you know? Where are the other exits? You need to start looking at that, okay? And we do that in policing all the time. Uh, we look for the exits, we, we role play in our head. What if I walk into that 7-Eleven and I walk in on a robbery? What will I do, okay? Uh, you know, if the guy's blocking the donut case, he's in trouble, okay? I'm just saying. All right, we got to have our nourishment. But well, let's look for the exits. When you go into a restaurant, where, where's another exit? Where's another exit? Okay, you go into Walmart and, and you're shopping and all of a sudden you hear, hear a bang. Your brain said, that sounded like a gunshot. It is a gunshot. Where's the exit? You got the front entrance and don't they have exits in the back? To where the employees are work go out that door just go don't try to analyze it don't see if anybody else is moving go get out of there right now let me say this don't leave carrying a 55 screen inch tv okay <laughs> that's called something else all right drop the merchandise and then exit all right so i'm just saying go well, sergeant trend has said to leave not with the merchandise, okay? So, so move, 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 okay? Know where your exits are. Uh, you're at work again, and you go to the restroom, role play in your head. Hey, if, if there was an active shooter right now, how would I get out of here? Where's my closest, where's the closest exits, okay? What would I do? You need to do that kind of role playing. So another thing you have to understand is what happens to your body when you're under a lot of stress, when you're fearful. When you hear what you think is a shots, shot or shots being fired where you're at, your heart rate is gonna just go through the roof, okay? So 60 beats per minute, 
That's our normal resting heart rate. 90 bits, beats per minute, uh, we lose what we call fine motor skills. So texting, I was going to say dialing a number, but that's old. It's texting. When you're texting, you can't do that. Your heart rate's racing. You can't, you can't text. Or even uh, hitting 911 on your cell phone might be difficult because you're so stressed. At 120 beats per minute, your gross motor skills kick in. And that's where you, your body is saying you're in danger. And it's, it starts to work automatically to, to sustain you, to save you. So it pumps more blood to your legs, to your upper body. And that's for whether you're going to fight. So you need more strength in your arms if you're going to fight. Or and you need more blood strength in your legs if you're going to run, flee. Okay? At 150 beats per minute, you can't think. You can't really process anything. And... Uh, at 175, forget it, you're just frozen uh, and you're doing other things that you don't want to know about, okay? But your body is excreting all kinds of, it's shutting down, trying to protect you. So we refer to how we think as the human brain versus the lizard brain. So if you think about it, when you have uh, uh, animals in the wild, when they hear a noise, what do they do? They run, right? You got two deer out grazing, and they hear a noise and look up in the tree, and there's they see a, a guy standing there pointing a stick at them. Right? Do they have a discussion? Hey, 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 Fred, you see that guy up in the tree? You think he's going to shoot us? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he met his quota, and he surely won't violate state law by exceeding that. You know, they don't have a discussion, right? They hear a noise. They run. One runs. They all run. They don't have a discussion. They don't look for val validation. It's, hey, if he's running, there's danger. I'm running also, right? But what do we do, the human brain? What do we do? We analyze. We try to break it down. We sometimes, a lot of times, override what our body is telling us. Our, our body will tell, will tell us when we're in danger. Okay? Our body will tell us, our brain. Have you ever been walking down the street and you just saw somebody standing on the corner and you got that feeling, that person's up to no good, right? That person's up to no good. And that person could just be sitting there, just looking. But you don't know why you, you sense that, but you sense it. That, you, your brain just said, that person's up to no good. Now, if you stopped and broke it down second by second, you probably could finally realize what it is that person is doing that uh, led you to believe he or she is up to no good, right? But it, it's quick. Your body's going to tell you that person is up to no good. Just your experiences, you know, how people behave. Your body's going to tell you, and you need to listen to that. But what do we do? Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, ladies, uh, you press the elevator button, door opens, there's a guy on the elevator, and, and, and you get that feeling. He scares you. He scares you. But what do we do? We go, well... It'll be impolite for me not to get on. You know, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to hurt his feelings. So I'm going to get on and hope and hope nothing happens and hope. So let me let me say this. Who gives a crap about this guy's feelings, right? Who gives a hit about this guy's feelings, right? Let me tell you, I guarantee you 100% he's going to get over it, right? He's, his little hurt feelings, he's going to get over it, you know? Don't worry about being politically correct. He's going to get over it. But your body told you in an instant, danger, danger. But you overrode that signal 
and got on because you don't want to be rude, perceived as rude or politically incorrect or whatever, and hope that nothing happened. Forget that. Forget that, right? Listen to your body. Listen to your body. Listen to the warnings that your body gives you, okay? Don't get on. Forget him. Let him get his feelings hurt. But what, what do you know? You know you survived. Nothing happened to you, right? And if you get on that elevator with those feelings of danger and hope that nothing happened and something does, are you ever going to get over it? Are you ever going to get over it? No. So listen. Listen to your body. Listen to those warnings that your body naturally gives you, okay? Forget about being politically correct. Have that lizard brain where you just run. You just run, okay? All right. Uh, Gavin DeBecker wrote a book, The Gift of Fear, years ago. Excellent book. And in that book, he discusses how our body is tuned to give us warnings about danger, dangerous situations we're in. But what happens? We override it and suppress those feelings because we don't want to be rude, we, we uh, don't want to be politically incorrect or perceived as this type of person or that type of person. And, and, and what you have to do is listen to the warnings your body gives you. Be, have a lizard brain. Take action. If, you're, if your body says you're in danger, listen to it. Don't, don't ignore it. So when your heart rate zooms, you're, you're in danger, and your heart rate goes, goes skyrocketing, how do you regain control? So you want to calm yourself. You want to do what we call combat breathing. You might have heard it as yoga breathing, or, or there's several names for it. But basically what it is, to get your heart rate back down where you can think clearly and, and take action, you want to breathe in slowly for a count of four, and then you want to breathe out slowly for a count of four. So in and out. In and out, and it'll slow your heart rate quite a bit so that you can think clearly, okay? So combat breathing for police, yoga breathing for you all, okay? <laughs> so you also want to shift your emotions. So you hear a shot or several shots, your heart rate zooms, you're scared, you're in fear, which is understandable, but take that fear and turn it into anger, you know? So you got somebody that's an active shooter in your, your space. Take that fear and turn it to anger, okay? Let me share a story with you. So 28 years ago, I was on patrol midnight shift. I was at the 7-Eleven relaxing, okay? I had a donut maybe, <laughs> maybe. So a taxi driver comes in and says, hey officer, there's this fight down the street. And I go, ah. <laughs> I finished my donut, okay? I go down the street, and there's the fight. So there's this female. She has this guy in a headlock, yeah. right? And she's whack. She's just whacking him. She's crying and tears just streaming down her face. And she's going, I love you, whack. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not exaggerating. Each time she hit him, his feet came off the ground. Okay? I'm not exaggerating. So she goes, whack, I love you. Why'd you do that? And being the, the sharp officer I was, I realized that's her boyfriend, and he was seeing somebody else. She's in a lot of pain. She's going to give him a lot of pain. Okay? So, so I thought it was only fair that I let her get in a couple of more whacks before I stop it. Okay? So whack! And whack. And then, so I move in, and I pull, try to pull her away from him. She, she's so focused on whacking him, right? I struggled with her. I struggled with her to get her away from him. I struggled with her 
to handcuff her, right? Now, her anger wasn't focused at me. She wanted to get back at him. And, and I struggled, right? I finally get her handcuffed, put her in the car, take her to jail. And when I get to the jail, I'm filling out the jail paperwork. And it asks for her height. And I'm going, whew, man, I had a struggle with her. I'm 5'6", which is tall, okay? <laughs> she has to be at least 5'8", right? So I put her on there five foot eight inches. I get her out of the car and she's right here. Okay? She's right. So you know what happened? You know what happened? From the time I arrested her, time I got to jail, she shrunk four inches. All right? She shrunk. I was going to call Ripley's, believe it or not, but I said, never mind. So the point of the story is she, she was in pain right? He cheated on her. She was in pain. Her pain turned into anger. It was focused. She had power. Uh, each time she hit him, she had power. Uh, no boxing skills, no mixed martial arts skills or whatever. She had power because that anger was focused, okay? I struggled to handcuff her because she was trying to get back at him. I mean, so there's power. And when I say the way you are now, the tall, short, overweight, whatever, when you take that fear and turn it into anger, anger against this active shooter, you have power, okay? You don't need any special skills to defeat an active shooter, okay? So if you think about it, that active shooter is a piece of SOB because what he, that active shooter is trying to do is kill you because he or she has a sorry life, right? So they want to inflict pain on you and your family for a lifetime because they're a piece of whatever, okay? Do you understand that? They have no right to do that. They have no right to take you away from your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your loved ones, right? They have no right to inflict that kind of pain on your loved ones, which will last, last a lifetime. So turn, take that fear and go, oh, excuse me, <laughs> mother, oh, I'm good. You come in here, I'm going to tear your, tear you up, all right? I'm going to tear you up because you're a sorry piece and you have no business trying to inflict pain. On you. Forget you, I'm going to tear your up, okay? Do you understand that? Take that fear and turn it into anger. Get it focused. That gives you strength. Have you ever heard uh, of, of, of people picking up a car to save somebody? You know, uh, last year there was a story uh, where a 17-year-old girl uh, saved her father's life. Her father was working uh, under the car, and the jack uh, fell, and the car was crushing him. And she immediately somehow put her hip to the car and lifted it up enough and pulled them out, okay? And uh, she was on the Ellen show and all that stuff. But, but where did that strength come from? There was an urgency, life and death, and you have power. We all have power that we're not, we're not even aware of, you know. Uh, so just remember that. You take that fear, turn it to anger and tear that mother up, okay? All right, they got no right to do what they're, what they're doing because they got a sorry life. You also want to do mental scripting, and that's simply role play in your head. Hey, what if I'm walking down the street, I'm at the mall, and I hear shots? Where are the exits? I'm gonna go that way, okay? I'm at work, uh, I'm at my cubicle, and I hear what sounds like shots fire. I can't escape, so what am I gonna do? Okay, I'm gonna lock myself in this office. I'm gonna barricade myself in this office, okay? So just do those little mental scripting. So after deliberation, then you take action. This all can take seconds, or for some that aren't prepared for it, it could take minutes, and minutes could cost, cost you your life, okay? So the, the more you rehearse this in your mind, if it does happen, you're, you're quicker to take action. So active shooter events. So the definition of an active shooter, 
An active shooter event involves one or more persons engaged in killing or attempted to kill multiple people in an area occupied by multiple unrelated individuals. That's a long definition, and that's more for police for, for, uh, to keep stats, okay? What you need to understand about an active shooter is they're trying to kill as many people as quickly as possible, okay? They're trying to kill as many people as quickly as possible because they know in a few minutes police will be arriving, okay? That's their fo sole focus, to kill as many people as quickly as possible, right? This definition really doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, what their motivation is, it doesn't matter. When they're trying to kill you, do you really care if they're, they were bullied in school or it's a, they're trying to make a political statement? It doesn't matter. Just know that they're trying to kill you. So these are active shooter events from 2000 to 2013. They're happening everywhere. So they happen everywhere. In 2014, we had 20 active shooter events. 2015, another 20. Okay, they just keep keep uh, keep increasing. So from 2000 to 2013, 160 active shooter events. Again, they just keep increasing. So where do the attacks happen? Quite a bit at schools, but uh, uh, just more at commerce, the place where you work, okay? So the shooter profile. There's no profile for a shooter. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, the shooter could be as young as 10 years old, uh, as old as, uh, I think the one in Baton Rouge was 55 years old, okay, uh, look like grandpa, you know, kind of like, like you, all right, <laughs> don't look, don't look, he's not, he's not a shooter, okay, they can be, they can be white, black, Asian, Middle Eastern, okay, male, female, there, there's no profile, okay, they could be trying to make a political statement, they could be making a religious statement, uh, they could be making a racial statement. They could be uh, getting uh, going on this rampage because uh, they were bullied in school. There is no profile, okay? Uh, a lot of them, of course, they feel like they're the victim and they want to get even. And so a, a lot of them will broadcast, they'll uh, post their blogs, what they're feeling, what they're going to do, whatever. So know that these shootings don't just happen on the, on, on the spur. They've planned this out. They've planned it out. They've thought it out, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. Okay? So there's no profile. Back in the 80s when we had a serious gang problem here, you could look at somebody and know what gang they belong to. Why? Because their color. Okay, he's wearing blue, blue clothing. That's this gang. He's wearing red clothing. That's this gang. Uh, this one's using this kind of hand signal. That's that gang. And they got so proud that they tattoo their gang affiliation on their neck. You just read their neck, and they'll tell you. When we're dealing with active shooter, we don't have that. It could be anybody. And there's, there isn't a, a standard profile for one. So their relationship to where they, they, they launch their attack. 55% Fifty, 55%. 
they probably went to that school or they worked at that place of business, 45%, there was no connection. It's almost half and half. You know, it really doesn't matter sometimes. So the number of deaths depend on how quickly the police arrive and target availability. So again, the active shooter is looking to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible, right? So if you make yourself a hard target, then they can't accomplish their goal. Average response time for police to an active shooter event, three minutes. That's, that's, that's really quick. But in that three minutes, how many times can that person pull that trigger? Um, unbelievable number of times. Okay, so nobody moved. You heard gunshots and nobody moved. That's okay, because I'm here to protect you, okay? <laughs> you felt safe, that's okay. So don't deny, you, if your brain said that, was, that sounded like a gunshot, it is a gunshot, and move. Take action, go immediately to deliberation. What are you gonna do? What exit are you gonna go out of, right? So you're at work, you hear what sounds like a gunshot? Go, get your friend. Hey, Mary, did you hear that? That, that sounds like a gunshot. Let's get out of here. And if Mary doesn't go, what do you do? You go, bye-bye, Mary, and you go, right? You go, right? And when you exit, you keep going. You keep going. You keep going, right? Don't stop to look at the building. If you can see the building, the shooter can see you, right? So you keep going out of sight. And what, ha what actually is going to happen is you'll probably be already hearing sirens. Then, then you know, oh, something is going on. And you keep going. You keep going, all right? Uh, if you don't hear any sirens, you can call back to the office and, and call your supervisor. Hey, how, everything okay over there? And, and, and if they answer, then you know, okay, there's nothing going on. You can come back to work, right? Okay? So, so, uh, so, when you come back to work, what's very important is that if somebody thought they heard a gunshot and they left and they come back and you say and you, you ask ask, hey, where'd you go? I said, Well, I, I thought I heard a gunshot, so like Sergeant Trindez said, I just left. You know? What's really important is that you support them, okay? This is a serious matter. You support them. You don't make fun of them. You know, even at our age, we don't want to be look foolish. We don't want to be made fun of. So what you need to do to support them is say, hey, that's, that's, you did the right thing. I wish I heard that. I wish I'd gone with you. Uh, you did the, exactly what you're supposed to do. You need to support each other, okay? Whether it's family or friends or coworkers, you need to support each other. So if somebody moves, takes action, goes out the door, running out the door, don't make fun of them if it turns out not to be anything, okay? Now, let me just say this. You, you, you take action, you go out the door, and your supervisor calls you and, and, and asks, hey, where are you? And you re your response is, Shreveport? <laughs> That's called a vacation, okay? That's not uh, taking action because you thought you heard a gunshot, all right? Don't do that. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, so if you hear it, if your brain says gunshot, it is a gunshot, get out of there. Okay? Now, if you can't escape, that's not a tactic. Okay? Hiding under your desk and hoping, we know now, you know, we've learned. That's not a tactic. That's not going to help you. The Virginia Tech shooter, uh, prior to executing his murder scheme, he went to the local range and he placed targets on the, on the ground. So for those of you who have been uh, uh, shot, where do you put the target normally? At a range. It's up here. It's up here. All right. He placed his targets on the ground 
and the people at the range thought that was kind of odd. And then he went down and shooting at the targets. So what's he doing? He's rehearsing. He's rehearsing. Where is he expecting to find his victims? Uh, on, hiding under the desk. So he's, he's rehearsing. That's where he expects them to find. That's not, that's, not, that's not a tactic, okay? So if you can't escape, what you want to do is you want to lock yourself in a room, okay? Barricade the doors. Put furniture up on, uh, against the door to make it difficult for that shooter to get in if they, if tr they try to get in. So the first thing you want to do is avoid. You hear a gunshot, get out of there, all right? If you can't escape, then you want to deny. You want to get yourself in a room, lock the door, and put furniture up against the door, barricade yourself in there, okay? You want to silence your cell phone, turn off the lights, so that, if, you know, a lot of these um, office doors, they have the little side window, you know? Turn off the lights, you know, so they, that they can't peek in and, and see that you're there. Excuse me. So this is a city council hearing somewhere. I'm not sure what city it is. So watch what happens, and then uh, we'll, we'll discuss it. And for the you can notice it's on the charges we have there. And as part of the plan we have, the workshop we're going to have following this meeting, but um, this will be the first step in that whole process. I have a motion. So he told everybody to leave. So I won't show the whole thing. So what happens is uh, uh, more police arrive, and then he ends up shooting at the city council people. Uh, officers shoot at him, and then he ends up uh, committing suicide, shoots himself. And nobody else uh, died. So, so what you got to understand uh, is that to survive an active shooter encounter, you got to look at the warning signs. If there's any warnings beforehand, you got to look at that. All right, so it's a city council hearing. He's upset about taxes. He's upset about taxes. So he comes in and has a spray can and pssst. So, t so think to yourself, when are you going to move? Pssst. Pssst. When are you going to move, right? People have a right to protest, right? There's any number of ways to protest. You got to think about your safety, your safety. So he starts, Psh. if I wasn't a police officer, as soon as I saw the spray can, I'm out of there, okay? But I'm an officer and I'll stay to protect. <laughs> but okay, so think about this. So he sprays, yes, you look, oh, He's protesting, but what's going to happen? What's he doing? He's committing a crime, right? Criminal mischief. He's spray painting the wall, right? At the minimum, he's going to jail, right? At the minimum, he's going to jail. So do you really want to watch him get arrested? Because you don't know how far he's going to go, right? So what I'm saying is if the police have to lay hands on him, get out of there. You don't need to be a witness because you don't ever know where it can go. You know, a lot of times they say, well, the person, oh, he, he was unarmed. 
No, the police officer has a gun. Officers have had their guns taken from them and shot with their own gun, right? So do you want to take a chance that something like that might happen? So, hey, he's going to get arrested. You should be up. Get out of there. Now, the city council members, they might have to stay, you know, but, but you don't. Get up and leave. Watch it on the news to find out what happened, right? And when you're watching on news, you know you are safe. Don't stay around to see what's going to happen. So in San Bernardino, when, when they had that shooting, people across the street, the next building over, this is the same complex, but the next building, so you had somebody filming as the police were rushing in, and they're, they're making comments. Hey, look, the police are, they're really running. Wow, they're heavily armed. Wow, there must be something going on. <laughs> when you see police with rifles or their guns out, that's not good, right? That's not good. That's a warning. Warning. Danger. Danger. If I don't have to be, let me get out of there, right? Watch it on the news, what happened, right? If an if officer has his gun out, yeah, you're not part of it. You're not the bad guy. But let me tell you, if a bullet goes off, bang, does that bullet go good guy, good guy, good guy, bad guy? It, does, it goes in a straight line. You might be in the path of that bullet, right? Don't stick around to watch what happens. Don't stick around to film it on your cell phone to, 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 to be part of that, what's going on, okay? Officer has a gun out, get out of there, right? It's about protecting yourself. Another one time, midnight shift patrol again. One of my uh, friends gets into a pursuit of a stolen vehicle, and, and everybody's trying to meet with him. We want part of that chase, you know, it's exciting. Oh, that's man, oh, it's great, oh. You know, then uh, the suspect bails out. It's a foot chase. They jump some fences. Suspect shoots my friend, right? He doesn't know where he's at. We don't know where he's at. So imagine how we're all frantic. Uh, how badly is he hurt, whatever. We find him. Now we're looking for the suspect, right? So I got my gun out. I'm in the driveway of some house. I'm looking under the car. I got my gun, my flashlight. I'm looking under the car. And then I turn, and over my shoulder is a lady in her nightgown looking with me. <laughs> really? 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 She, you think we trained together. She was right on my shoulder looking under the car with me. I have my gun out. <laughs> Get in the house. Get in the house. What is she thinking? What is she thinking? <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, could be. But, you see, let's, don't assume just because we're not the bad guy, you got to think in terms of safety. Safety. Gun, you see a gun? Not a good sign. Let me get out of here. I'll watch it on the news. Okay? Take that in. So you want to avoid leave as soon as possible. Know your exits. Call 911. Okay. So consider secondary exits. Windows. So you weren't able to escape through a, a regular exit. You locked yourself in an office. Okay? Does that office have a window? All right. What kind of window? Can you open it or is it just a plate glass? All right. Can you break that plate glass? You know, a lot of people think, ah, it's not an exit, so I can't exit that. No. If there's an active shooter, there's shots being fired, grab that chair, ah! Just smash the out of that window, right? Go out that window, okay? Now, on, let me say this. You hear, bang, your brain says a gunshot. Don't go, ah, smash windows, okay? What you're going to hear is, bang, 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 you know, more shots, 
Now you know what you have. It's, a, it's not a backfire. It's not firecracker. Now you know that's shots being fired. Yes, now smash that window, okay? All right? Because I don't want to hear Sergeant Trinidad said, bust up those windows. Okay? So you lock yourself in a room you weren't able to avoid, you want to deny, lock yourself in a room. Turn off the lights, start putting furniture up against the door to make it difficult for them to get in. So now if you're in a, in a room where the door opens out, then you might use a rope or you might use a belt to put on the door handle and hold on to it. Hold it, hold it shut. So once you're in the room, you've barricaded you got to make a plan. If you're in there with other people, you have to make a plan. If you're in there by yourself, you have to make a plan. What if that shooter tries to get into this room? What am I going to do? How am I going to defeat that, that shooter? Okay? And just think about this. So, so the shooter has, most of them are, got, have rifles. If he forced his way in that doorway, that rifle is going to come through before he actually comes through, right? So if you're in the room with other people, you make a plan. Hey. I want you to, I want you, well, here, what's this pen? It's a weapon, right? And what are you going to do with this? What are you going to, what are you going to stab? Right, you're going to attack. Take that fear, turn it to anger. That SOB is not going to take my life. And, ah, ah, ah. Right? So when you're attacking the face, what's this shooter going to do? That hand reflects, it's just going to come up to protect his face. So either both hands will come off the gun or one hand will come off the gun, right? He might still be pulling the trigger, but, but be less effective, okay? So I need you, you attack the face, I'll grab the rifle. You understand that? And if there's more people, hey, you, you bite the, sh sh the crap out of his arm or something, okay? So you got to make that plan because... That it, I'll back up. <laughs> but you got to fight, and you got to understand that person is trying to kill you, right? He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to kill you, inflict pain on you and your life, and inflict pain on your family, on your loved ones. You can't let them do that. So lockdown is not enough. So we've learned... From Texas University, Columbine, Virginia Tech, Aurora, Colorado. It's constantly changing. It's what's happening is constantly changing. So what we learned from Virginia Tech, when the SWAT team went in to Norris Hall, they had e e uh, medics with them. So as soon as they made entry, uh, the medics started treating the wounded, right? And they're credited with maybe saving a dozen lives because they were there quickly to stop the bleeding and and, and, and give medical attention. So now, because of that, uh, the new part of active shooter response for police is we're creating what we call rescue task force to escort medical personnel in there, into the building, to get to the victims and get them medical attention as quickly as possible. So it's constantly changing. So here in Virginia Tech, the shooter went to several rooms. The first room, uh, they took no action, because it, and it's happening real quick, okay? They took no action, so you see in red, 77% uh, of the students that were in that classroom were killed, and the others were shot. So as they start taking action, each, each of the rooms, you see the number of uh, killed goes down, and also the number of people shot go down. Classroom 205, they successfully denied the shooter access, so nobody in that classroom was shot or killed. So there are things you can do to, to, to increase your chances of surviving. And what you do matters. So, so if you know what to do, right? And like I said, we look to each other to validate our feelings of what we're gonna do. So if you know what to do, 
then people are going to follow you. They're going to follow you because they might be so filled with fear that they're just frozen. They don't know what to do. But if you know what to do, you can grab them. Hey, come with me. I know. And if you start taking action, people are going to follow you. They're going to follow you. And so you have the opportunity not only of saving your life, but to saving the lives of others. Okay? So you do that by mental rehearsal. What if, what if, what if. You hear a gunshot. Your brain says a gunshot. It's a gunshot. Take action. You see somebody with a gun. Police pull out a gun. That's not a good sign. Get out of there. Take action. Okay? Don't, don't linger. Uh, another thing you got to consider. So you're barricaded in a room. You put, up, you put furniture up against the door, and you made your plan with the people in the room with you, and then you hear, you hear this, the door. It's me, it's me, it's Mary. Mary, let me in, let me in. You know Mary. You like Mary. Mary's a co-worker. <laughs> what are you going to do? What? And you don't need to answer me. Uh, but that's something you have to think about. What are you going to do? So is it possible that Mary is the shooter? Remember, there's no profile. It, it could be a co-worker, male, female, young, old, you know, grandpa, you know, it, it could be anything. So Mary could be the shooter, right? Because she knows the plan. Hey, barricade yourself in office. Or is it possible that the shooter has a gun to Mary's head and telling her, you better get me in that room, right? So it's something you have to make a decision now. If you found yourself in that situation, what are you going to do, right? So what you do matters. So the attack starts. You got to decide where are your exits. Know where your exits are. So you, if you have an exit to go to, then you want to avoid the situation. Get out of there and keep going, keep going, keep going. If you can see the building, you're still too close. Turn the corner, get out of there, all right? Uh, on that note, let me say that a lot of uh, uh, businesses have uh, fire alarm plans, right? I don't know what your plan is, but a lot of plans are, hey, fire alarm goes off. Group A, you meet over here at this part of the parking lot. Group B, you meet over here at this part of the parking lot. C, you meet over here, right? Don't do that. And I might get in trouble for the, but don't do that, right? A better plan, because what does the shooter want to do? Shooter could be a coworker. He wants to kill as many people, or she wants to kill as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Can they set off that fire alarm knowing, hey, I'm going to have probably 100 people right here that have to stage right here, right? So that's not a good plan. A better plan is, hey, a fire alarm goes off, all of y'all disperse and report back to your supervisor. Call your immediate supervisor, and your supervisor could call their supervisor and say, hey, everybody's accounted for, okay? And remember, don't go to Shreveport. Come back to work if it's a false alarm, all right? So if you're able to avoid, great. If you're not able to avoid, you want to deny, lock yourself in a room, barricade the, the door with furniture. Look for other exits. Does that office have a window? Smash that window. Go out that, go out that window. If it has other exits, window is an option, then again, you're going back to avoiding. If there are no other exits, you want to make a plan to defend your position again. Pen, that's a weapon. If you got a fire extinguisher in that room, take that fire extinguisher. If you, 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 you hit them in the face, not going to be able to, to do much. Got a, you have a pocket knife, you got a metal file nail, those are weapons. So when the police arrive, you got to understand what we're going to do. So our number one goal when the police arrive is to stop the killing. You could be bleeding. You could be injured. We're going to go right past you. We're trying to get to that killer 
to stop the killing. You understand that? So don't cling to the officer. Don't stop him asking for help whatever, we're going to go right by you. We'll probably tell you, get out the door, go, go this way or whatever, but we're not going to stop to help you. The number one goal is to stop the killing, get to that killer and stop the killing. Then after that, after we get the killer, stop the killing, then we're going to try and stop the dying, get medical in there, get you, get you uh, if you're wounded, get you medical aid, get you out, okay? That, that's the priority. And then anybody else that's not been injured or whatever, then we'll start to evacuate the building. So when the police arrive, now you, gotta, you have to understand that we're going to get multiple calls. So one person going to call saying, hey, the suspect looks like this. Is this tall wearing this, wearing that? Then we're going to get another call. Somebody else giving a different, different description, right? We'll get multiple calls, so we don't, it would be confusing. So when officers are arriving, you know you're the good guy, but you need to have your hands up, okay? Show your hands, okay? And follow the officer's inst instructions. So if you're involved in an uh, active shooter event, expect that you might, it, it may be traumatizing, right? And you need to, might need to get some professional help. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So just be aware of that. Okay, that, that ends my presentation. Does anybody, uh, I'll, I'll take questions after in a little bit, okay? Thank you.